Gentlemen, what's good? Welcome back to another great, informative episode of Speak to the Mic, the podcast show. I am your illustrious and well-groomed, well-dressed host, Marlon Joseph. And here on this platform, we like to provide helpful and informational content to our Black community. We like to acknowledge and recognize those Black men and women, regardless of profession, uh, what their what their impact is and their level of impact as it pertains to helping moving the culture forward and and really more so praise them and give them their flowers for what, what they are doing in real time for helping our black community uh, regardless of their profession and uh, joining me today this young black brother is doing uh, ex- extraordinary things in the field of uh, finance and, and even preferably in the field of stock and investments. Uh, it's not even a way to even give him an introduction, but I'm going to do the best I can to do, do him a, a great justice of giving him this introduction because he's well-deserving of this. So Stephen Barge, he's a founder of Tenacity, which is an Atlanta-based real estate technology company. He's also uh, part, uh, a founder of uh, Bytes Hub, a vending machine company, as well as Barge Consulting Group, where he has leveraged his network to build a community of over 3,000 Black investors and taught them how to invest in the stock market. He also provides business consulting services. So Stephen also primarily focuses, focus, he, he puts his focus in the financial realm in the financial literacy uh, area. So he basically helps other people build generational wealth, preferably in the Black community, and help them reach their financial goals by lever, leveraging them the, the stock market and creating profitable based, uh, needed based businesses. I'm sorry for that, but yeah, this man is doing a lot of extraordinary things in the field of finance as it pertains to helping black people understand the stock market and what it means to be a black investor. Steven, I really appreciate you, man, for, for being on the show. Uh, definitely taking the time out to talk to me about this. So this episode is, is strictly money talk. Let's talk money, man, preferably how we as black people can get this money, man, because financial literacy is something that we have been struggling with for far too long. So much to a point where it's been a generational curse that we have that our generation preferably has to break. So out the gate, man, I want to jump into this, to this uh, episode to talk about this. So the first question I have for you, it should, it it probably should even be the last question, but I'm going to start off with this question. So, What are some of the best ways we can start creating generational wealth from your perspective? So from my perspective, I think uh, I preach this a lot to my community and I think it really starts in the mind. So a lot of people, when people start talking about generational wealth, you first have to have a mindset of generational wealth. So, uh, or, or, or a mindset of abundance, knowing that it's possible. So uh, here in the black community, a lot of times when we speak about investment or investing, it, we look at it as a negative uh, aspect because it's like, when you're investing in something, the first thing you think is a negative aspect to where, how can I not lose my money? How can I not, versus having the mindset of how can I grow wealth through using this instrument? Or, or this instrument to uh, make passive income. You know, so I think the, big, the biggest thing is removing the mindset of poverty or struggle and then kind of transitioning into a mindset of abundance, abundance. So I tell a lot of people like making passive income or building multiple income streams, it can be a little difficult, but um, some of the best ways to get started is really just having your mindset and knowing it's possible. The second thing is starting small budgeting, making sure that you're making uh, good financial habits. Um, in the Black community, a lot of times, as soon as our income raised, we start raising our expenses too. So Absolutely. you might get a raise at a job, and then you're like, oh, well, let me go get a, you know, a 2020 car, you know, even though you still got a nice car to get you A to B. So it's not saying that you can't live in luxury. It's just kind of saying you want to build um, your assets yeah. And then and then you want to use your assets to pay for your liabilities versus the other way around. A lot of people, they'll go use their money and you then go buy liabilities and then you're in debt. So we want to break the cycle by stepping into different things like stocks, creating uh, e-commerce stores, Etsy stores, things that's going to pay you 24 hours around the clock versus 
um, you know, outside of your nine to five, of course. And if you aspire to, if that business go and you aspire to do it full time, that's fine. But you want to put your money into different places. You want to plant your seeds and diversify your investments um, so that you can kind of have those multiple income streams. Yeah, absolutely, man. And you know, I want to I want to unpack something that you that you just briefly spoke about when it comes to the fact that we would, you know, kind of get a little more and then try to spend even more than what we what we've actually gained. And, and this is one of the most unfortunate facts about our community as a whole when it comes to finance or just money in general, right? So we spend the most, but we make the least. And we save and invest the least as well, mainly because we, we're oftentimes operating of a, under this survival mode mindset at, at all costs, where it's like, okay, well, you know what? Most of us coming from impoverished neighborhoods for the most part, and we we sit here and just focus in on trivial and fixate on trivial things like you know materialistic shit that basically don't hold any value and, and, and right. don't really mean much to us just to say that we got this and somebody else ain't got it. Right. So it's obviously feeding into that, that, that mantra or or that mindset that, that we oftentimes hear in music. And it's it's not to say that it's all music's fault for feeding our minds that information, but Mm -hmm. at the same token, watching too much TV and realizing that, okay, well, this person got this. You oftentimes see celebrities trying to act like normal people or regular everyday people and right. regular everyday people try to act like celebrities. Right. And from a financial yeah. standpoint, it's like, okay, I gained a little more, but let me save a little more. But we don't think that way. It's more of a, okay, let me splurge a little bit more since I I, I got it like that at this very moment of time versus yeah. thinking long term and saying, well, you know what? let me put some more away for later because now I'm I'm good right now. I need to be focusing on more so later when it comes to that that retirement plan or having an exit strategy of not wanting to work ever again. You know, at 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 a certain point in time in your life at a certain age, right? But some of those things we have to prioritize, and it starts it starts at home when it comes to that financial literacy piece and and just understanding how money works. It's just and I remember reading this interesting fact about how fast the dollar leaves the black household oh, versus man. other yeah. communities, right? Five, it don't take five minutes for a dollar to leave the black household versus, you know, other, other neighborhoods, like preferably the white neighborhood. It, it, it would take probably a week or so for that dollar to, to actually move out of that neighborhood. Why? Because they actually working together. Their, their cohesiveness is actually helping them all make money together versus mm-hmm. us. We, we sit up here trying to one up each other. It's making it a competition thing when it's like, no, it's enough money out here for all of us to eat versus saying, oh, I got more than you and I'm just going to throw that in your face. And it's like, why, why are we competing when we can be actually build, building something here that that we, we basically can have that generational wealth established for a generation that we won't even be alive to see. And right. that's the type of mindset that we need to prioritize more of when it comes to spending our money. We think, well, it's our money. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, but you're going to need that money later. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, we need to be more focused in on when it comes to educating ourselves about the importance of that dollar and how much it is, how much important it is to save and invest. And so, which brings us up to my next point about investing. So investments in stocks has really been growing and it has become prominent in today's society, especially for my uh, millennials. So what advice would you give those who are looking to go into buying stock and and just the overall stock market in, in general? What, what advice have you been given most of your and your clients, things of that nature when it comes to the stock market? Yeah. So when it comes to the stock market, I feel like a lot of people overcomplicate uh, investing. Um, I think the biggest thing is really knowing what you're getting yourself into. And the simplest way to get started in the stock market is really investing in things you use every day. Um, I have a conversation with a lot of my friends that go, you know, by Jays, you know, but they don't own any Nike stock, you know, yeah. uh, they got an Apple iPhone, but they, they, they don't own shares in Apple where Apple is maybe a hundred, $125 a share, you know, are in that range right now. Um, but you're, you'll, you'll rather go spend a thousand dollars on the iPhone, you know? So my biggest thing is with these, with the black community, we're already invested in these companies and most of these companies are not black owned. And we're using Absolutely. their products on the regular. So the the thing is, we got to look at stocks as a business relationship. When I when I when I invest in a stock, it now becomes a business uh, relationship in uh, in the instrument to build passive income. Because as soon as you buy a share, 
And if you never sell that share, that share is going to continue to cycle and grow over time. So yes, stocks do sell off, but over time, historically, over five, 10 year mark, the stock is only going to go up. The share price is going to continue to go up. So if we're investing, we got to realize that historically stocks are going to go up and we have to have the discipline to invest into the things that we know. You know, so the easiest way to get started in investing for me is one, investing in things you know, and the second is ETFs and index funds. So what ETFs and index funds is, is pretty much um, a basket of stocks. So like just for example, VOO, which is VU, um, that is the Vanguard S&P 500. This tracks over 500 stocks um, uh, and it's a basket of like different stocks like Apple, Google, Amazon, and it's diversified. So if you're investing into an ETF like this, you don't have to worry about the high risk of investing in a single stock, because if one of those stocks within that basket of stocks goes down for the day, your portfolio is not really uh, uh, hurt. It doesn't fluctuate as much as you investing in a single stock. So you're able to kind of start off getting a, a piece of the pie. And now we got fractional shares where if you can't afford to invest in the whole stock, you can invest in a, a, a standard dollar amount. So you have the flexibility now that we didn't have 10 years ago to get in the stock market. And honestly, I, I tell people all the time, other than real estate stock, the stock market is the easiest way to build wealth um, with the lowest barrier of entry. It's simple as downloading the Robinhood app, or Webull, you know, TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, and really just making a list of maybe five to 10 stocks, five to 10 companies that you know you use yeah. all the time. We wake up every morning, we use Colgate. We, we, I mean, we brush our teeth, you know? So why not invest in Colgate stocks? So you want to invest in companies that's going to be here five to 10 years, you know, from now, or that's been here, you know, the past five to 10 years, because those are going to be companies that's going to sustain. And then you can get a little riskier with companies that's newer, like the Teslas, um, the Blink, which is an EV charging company, um, you know, and uh, Lucid Motors, which is another EV company, um, you know, so you can kind of diversify, but I, I would suggest anyone who's new, start off with index funds or ETFs. Okay, yeah, and you know, it's a great thing that you pointed that out too, because I know the whole fundamental concept of buying stocks is you you buy low and you sell high, right? So that, that that's the whole yep. objective behind being able to profit from what you have actually invested in. So you want to make sure that you double, triple times that profit. And, and, and like to your point, the very things that we use and operate and just on a day-to-day -day basis, these are companies that we need to be putting putting that money towards as far as like actually investing in them versus just being consumers and mm -hmm. just consuming all of their products. Right. Actually, actually invest in the products because you see these products are booming. Like to your yeah. point, toothpaste is going to always be around. Uh, yeah. You know, you're going to always need glasses. You can always need clothes, things like that. Yeah. Or even with THC now becoming more legalized on an everyday basis when it comes to yeah. every single state is starting to open up and realize, okay, there's a lot of money in, 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 in just cannabis yeah. in general, right? So yep. these are the types of things people smoke weed all the time and before yep. it became legal, you know what I mean? Yeah. But not to even get on that, but now this is a booming industry when it comes yep. to investment. And so these are the types of things that we need to be looking more of and just try to educate ourselves on as it pertains to actually making our money work for us versus the other way around. And so that, that's something that is very important. And I think that all of us can definitely take from being able to invest in the stock or just start learning about those stocks. And to your point about not being able to afford the full shares of it, you still have those penny shares or, or those like certain amounts that you can actually get. Okay, if it's $100 a share, Let's see if you can get, okay, $20 within that $100. You'll still make a profit. It won't probably be the same amount that, that $100 share would, would probably get from that profit, but at least you will be profiting something, right? And it's all about taking those calculated risks when it when it comes to the stock market. It's going to be days where it's, it, it's going to fluctuate all the time. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, but yep. it's all about when to sell, when to buy, and things of that nature. And even for me personally, I'm, I'm learning that more and more too with the, the amount of shares that I'm buying. I, I, I've already bought uh, shares of American Airline, Delta Airline, AMC. Oh. When, when the whole situation happened with uh, with uh, Robin Hood and the uh, the AMC uh, uh, shares was going up and going down like that, like mm -hmm. they had, they, they came out uh, honestly just so adamant about the millennials sitting up here and just jacking the prices up to the AMC shares because yep. right now during the pandemic, a lot of people wasn't going to the movie theaters, but 
you know, as things started to start to open up, people, it was like gradually going. So it's like, okay, this is actually going to pick back up at some point in time. And so that made me realize, let me, let me throw it, let me grab some more shares of this because this is going somewhere that's going to be very profitable for yep. me later on, if, even if it's not at the, at the immediate time. So these are the and type of things that. that we need to very much so be very much so aware of and educated on when it's when in regards to making money, because it's the, it ain't just about us making money for ourselves. This is about future generations that we're not going to live to see. And we should, we should be operating with that mindset as a priority. Like, and, and it's not in the black community, unfortunately, it's, it's more about spend now and worry about later. later. That yeah. shit ain't been profiting for nothing. And, mm-hmm. and, and even in the financial industry, we have been shortchanged and been shortchanging ourselves literally and figuratively when it comes to not being in this financial game. Because mm-hmm. in the financial game, it ain't about black and white. It's about yep. green. It's yep. about that money. So we need to be sitting here investing in ourselves and, 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 and buying the, uh, buying stocks uh, and shares in, in the different companies that we obviously use on an everyday basis because this is something that's going to be profitable for us now and later if we think about it. So from that perspective, that's something that we, it's a priority, man. Again, the nine to five, and, and that's that's my other question going into this to this segment. So in regards to the nine to five, right? So a lot of times, and I've, I've had people even ask me this question to make sure I ask you this. Mm-hmm. Can can you actually make a lot of money in, in investments, or it just save a lot of money for that matter? Still working a nine to five, or how does it work? Can you still have a nine to five and obviously still create that generational wealth? Can you still build generational wealth with working a nine to five? Yeah, um, it might take you most definitely. Uh, I started investing uh, maybe over ten years ago, and that's when I. I got more aggressive um, leaving college, uh, you know, into my transitioning in my first job in my career. And I was investing in stocks there. And I was just keeping it simple, buying shares when I would get paid like every two weeks um, and, and increasing more shares there. So like when I was building my stock portfolio, my goal was to, uh, you know, just grow that portfolio over time and consistently invest. So if anybody is new to investing, I tell them all the time, it's not about how much you invest. Because a lot of people think, well, how much I need to get a profit, you know, or people are trying to make a quick flip, you know, um, the, the, it's not about the amount, it's about being consistent, you know, um, when you're when you're purchasing these shares, you want to make sure that you're buying these shares, you know, at a decent price, um, on those red days, if you see stocks in your portfolio are, are red and they're down, those are the days when you buy more, so a lot of times when people cry, I tell people, don't cry during the dip, buy during the dip. That's one of my sayings okay. in my group. And I mean, like if these stocks, a lot of times stocks are going to go up before they, but before they reach new levels, they have to sell off a little bit. So we have to have that financial discipline, um, just like anything else in life, fitness, uh, the way we eat, health, we have to have that financial dif- discipline also. So as far as the aspect of investing with your nine to five, you want to create a consistent budget that you can know you can invest uh after expenses and invest in the market consistently now to expand on if you're investing in uh, individual stocks or etfs that would be you know up to you my my take is you know to invest in etfs again what etf stands for is exchange traded funds so um he spoke about a lot about the cannabis industry so the cool thing about etfs is you have different etfs for different industries so qqq follows NASDAQ, the top 100 stocks in NASDAQ. So if you want to invest in tech, which I'm, I'm a big tech guy, so I invest heavily in tech, I invest in QQQ. Um, if I want to invest in cannabis stocks, you have three ETFs, uh, maybe more now, um, but you got MJ, uh, which is a, a cannabis ETF that, that actually ha- allocates a lot of uh, cannabis stocks uh, within it. Um, you have PotX, um, and you also have YOLO, um, Y-O-L-O, you know, so you have ways to diversify your income into these different sectors and as marijuana is get legalized these uh etfs are going to grow over time you know so it's, it's different ways that you can kind of go about it but you can definitely invest with a nine to five you don't have to quit your job to invest or trade or whatever um you just have to be consistent and if you're buying shares if you're trading Trading is totally different from investing. So a lot of people are, options trading is kind of a trend right now. A lot of people are trading options, but I tell people always start off with stocks first. Yeah. That's going to be what you want to want to do. Okay. Yeah. And you know what? A lot of times too, most of us in the black community get discouraged off the fact of thinking that, oh, 
you know, buying shares and, and being invested in stocks is basically for rich people, right? But mm -hmm. everyday working people like you, like me and you, we can actually profit from it too. Maybe yep. not as much as they do because they actually, they, they put more money into right. uh, investing in those, those shares and buying those shares and things like that versus us. We're right. looking to make relatively, you know, some, some decent money. But obviously yeah. if, if the stocks, if the shares, like five thousand dollars a share, they can make plenty of money off the off that profit by buying plenty of those shares versus us. We're looking more the lines of okay, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars, but it's being able to budget a yeah. se a set amount of money from your everyday nine to five mm -hmm. uh, and saying, okay, you know, I'm gonna take this amount of money and just put it in, in, into the stock market and buy shares for just with this money. And as right. it grows, then should that amount that you put in should grow as well mm -hmm. because you it's an investment. You're buying shares to make that money work for you and bring you back even more than what you put into it. And so yep. that's something that we have to always be constantly focusing in on and basically just monitoring on an everyday basis. And I know a lot of times monitoring it can be time consuming too. And it can just freak you out when you're seeing shit just going up and down. Like, okay, uh, do I buy any more? Or do I need to sell it right now? Is this not going to be profitable for me? And people get discouraged from that aspect too. And even, even still like, to zone in on one specific types of uh, one one specific type of sharing, so with Bitcoin, so with cryptocurrency in general, it's oh, been man. something that's been booming. I know for me, I remember when the uh, what was it was Bitcoin when Bitcoin first started out a few years ago, it was mm -hmm. pennies, literally literally pennies on the dollar when it came to the shares. Mm -hmm. I look now, it's like sixty thousand dollars a share, and I'm like, damn. Why in the hell did I not buy those shares when I had the time and opportunity to do so? And so mm -hmm. for me, the, seeing how fast cryptocurrency has become very, very prominent and very popular when it comes to buying shares and just being able to hold off and being patient with the market, because it's, it's so many different types of cryptocurrency now. It's like, okay, listen, the next one is going to boom go ahead and buy hundreds of shares of those penny shares right now, because it's going to profit later on. But we don't always, we're not patient with the, with our money. We're not patient in general. So it's like, I don't want to wait two years. I don't want to wait five years. I want to make this money now. It's like this instantaneous mindset. We have to break free from this shit because that's been so detrimental to us. It's like we, we, we're living in these microwavable times was like, I want this shit to happen right now. And it doesn't work that way. We yep. have to develop some patience with any, any damn thing that we do. And I always say this in almost every episode I've done is that Rome wasn't built in the day, right? We have to be able to maintain that patience and say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to hold off. And when I see the right time to buy or when to sell, that's when I'm going to do that versus I want to do it now. I want to make money yep. now. It doesn't work like that, especially in the stock market. So what do you say for people who are looking to get into that, mainly from a cryptocurrency perspective? So just talk a little bit about that. So the biggest thing with crypto is, so I want to explain what crypto is uh, for the people. That yeah, that's another question I was going to get to as well. I, I meant so, to ask that first. Yeah. yeah, no problem. So what crypto is, is pretty much it's peer to peer. It's a peer to peer exchange. Um, so what a lot of people refer to cryptocurrency is being traded on the blockchain. So what we call the stock market or for the crypto, we call it the blockchain. So the blockchain consists of um, transactions, which are called smart contracts. So smart contracts, they are, they, they're, they pretty much manage how uh, the cryptocurrency is bought and sold. And these transactions are heavily encrypted. So like transactions in your bank account, we know you know, what date it was uh, transacted or when it was sent. It has a reference code, things like that. But uh, cryptocurrency transactions are a little bit more secure because of these smart contracts. Um, so if we're looking at cryptocurrency, we're, we want to look at it as, for one, right now it's non-regulated. So non-regulated means the government doesn't have their hand on versus the stock market. So the government <laughs> has the, a big hand on the stock market uh, because financial institutions are invested. Um, as well as, uh, you know, big banks and things like that, um, as, as far as hedge funds also. So mm -hmm. at any time, like we saw earlier this year, they can sell off a lot of stocks and make the market go down and manipulate the market. Um, so when Biden first 90 days at the beginning of the year, they rotated money from tech 
and rolled it into buns because your money is more safer in buns during a volatile period. Um, so, okay. and then they started rotating it back to tech um, in recent months. So that's why we saw Apple start going up, Google, things like that, you know? So um, within those vehicles, cryptocurrency is buy and hold. So with crypto, we don't know. It's, it's driven by us. Um, so yeah. if it's a lot of buyers, it'll go up. If it's a lot of sellers, it'll go down. Um, so it's driven by us. But I tell people, if you're buying crypto, buy and hold forever. Don't don't try to time the market. Just get in the market. Buy some shares. Hold it. Do research on the company. Um, it's a lot of shit coins out there. Um, shit coins are things that's not profitable. Businesses that's not profitable. So make sure that you're kind of diversifying and making sure that you're going to invest in the correct vehicle, you know, because at the end of the day, this is your money. So if yep. you're not educating yourself on what you're investing in, you're kind of gambling, you know. So yep. with crypto, it's buy and hold. Like if you're going to get Bitcoin, you'll buy some today. And when Bitcoin goes red and it's going down again, you'll buy some more when it's going down. Um, you can also use a thing that's called, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. We'll come back to it. But okay. um, pretty much, it's, it's pretty much your investing consistently. So let's just say you do $200 this week. Let's say Bitcoin is down, um, dollar cost average. So let's just say Bitcoin is down next week, but this is your week to invest your $200. Maybe you invest 250 since it's down. And then once that Bitcoin re recovers and goes up, it's going to grow that portfolio a lot more quicker. So you want to invest on the lows, on the low ends, and then just be patient. Um, I think you spoke a good fact on instant gratification. In the black community, we always want something quick. I don't know, so I don't, so make it clear, I don't trade Forex. I don't knock anyone who do. But <laughs> Forex has scarred the black community because the thing is, with my group, I teach people on how to invest long-term as well as options trading. But the first question I get is people ask me about my course, they're like, is it a monthly fee? So that automatically, let me tell you, that tells me you've been trading Forex because a lot of times Forex has, Forex is good. Forex has been around for a few years. So the actual trading of Forex on like E-Trade or a certain account, it's nothing wrong with that. But the multi-level marketing schemes that's out now, which is like our markets live um, and these people that's acting as financial experts, they're really, it's a recruiting game, you know? So yeah. if I bring in five people, you get your membership free and they're making money off bringing in people versus educating people on the skill. So it's more people making money off recruiting versus the skill. And that's, that's something that I do want to clear up in the black community. Anytime you mention stocks, it is, it has nothing to do with Forex. Um, I think a lot of people confuse that. So stocks and Forex is different. Stocks is the trading of, of just companies and being able to invest in companies and, uh, be a part of their appreciation or long-term growth. Um, as far as um, Forex, you're investing, it's a foreign exchange market. So it's kind of just like if you're going the, out of overseas, uh, currency changes every day and the value changes. So you're, you're investing in one currency and pretty much you're exchanging it for another currency when that, that, when that price is at, at a, a higher value. Um, but it's two separate things. And I, I want to clear that up because it's a lot of confusion. A lot of people would be like, do you trade Forex? Is there a monthly fee or anything like that? It's like, no. Uh, with my investment community, uh, only thing we do is focus on stocks. Um, yeah. I'm real big on people bring it, building long-term portfolios just because that instant gratification, like you're not, people want to invest in stocks today and make money tomorrow. Yeah. And it's not, it doesn't work like that. Companies don't grow that quick. The typical company usually takes five years to be profitable after being on the stock market. So you got think you got companies like WeWork um, that's been on the stock market for years is still not profitable. So these companies, and that's when you're looking in your fundamental analysis or fundamental uh, fundamental game on like maybe Yahoo, you're looking at their debt, you're looking at yeah. income statements, you're looking at their cash flow. And if these companies aren't, you know, if their balance sheet aren't, isn't showing that the, the cash flow is positive, these companies are struggling to still be financial because they allocated some shares to investors, they uh, allocated, you know, early equity to investors that they're trying to make up for for funding that company. So sometimes what we want to do is when I invest in stocks long term, I tell people, think about five to 10 year growth. When you're looking at these ETFs or you're researching the stock, go look at the five year growth. Look at the one year growth. 
and look at the percentage and think, hey, if I would have put $1,000 in my account or $100 in my account, this is how much it would have grown. And, and if you go do that, that makes you realize how powerful the stock market is, you know? So uh, I think we talked a little bit earlier about my story and how I got started in the stock market was, I was, I, so I went to a small HBCU called Boyd's College in South Carolina, Denmark, South Carolina. My accountant professor happened to be a trader. Now, as far as my, my childhood background, I grew up not knowing about anything but saving. My mom used to say, save, save, save. No one never taught me how to invest. Um, I grew up in a, a single parent household with five boys um, where we grew up on, you know, Section 8 welfare, things like that. So investing wasn't something that was big in my, in my family. You know, ownership wasn't something that's big in my family. You know, generational wealth wasn't something that was taught in my family. So seeing these aspects growing up, it triggered something inside me to where I'm like, yo, I have to educate myself on business. I want to learn how to build businesses because I see people that own businesses, these people are successful. So the people that are around, you know, they kind of influenced uh, me growing up, you know, influenced the, the way in the path I took. Um, but also when I went to college, my accountant professor, he, he was actually a trader. So I, the whole reason of me becoming an accountant major is just because I want to educate myself on money as much as possible. So I wouldn't grow up having to live how I did in my childhood, you know. And so I use that fuel uh, of that struggle to kind of manifest into like what the life that I'm living today. So, you know, and even picking up some pieces and some seeds, you know, with my accountant professor being a trader, he actually, you know, kind of educated us on stocks, long-term investing, intrinsic and extrinsic value, um, options trading, um, and a lot of other aspects that I teach within my course now, but I didn't take it seriously because I was like 16 and 17, you know, so a 16, 17 year old kid, I'm no, thinking you, about you gonna take like, it like that seriously. You, you yeah, thinking exactly. about money exactly. right now. You ain't thinking about money exactly. later. Exactly. It's, it's exactly. Exactly. But it's crazy because I was 17 with the same mentality some grown adults have now. So my mindset was like, if he got all this money, why is he here? Why is he a teacher? Right, exactly. Why is he doing this? And it's a lot of people that, you know, that may not know me personally or they might see, they might look for things and they'll be like, well, if he's teaching all these people, he's making all this money on courses, well, uh, or you educate people on the stock market and making all this money. Well, why does he have this? Why doesn't he have that? It was crazy. The, the, all that materialistic <laughs> shit you would really just screw your damn mind up. And it's like, <laughs> listen, you realize yeah. the the most wealthiest people in the world don't don't show their wealth off. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like Bill Gates, um, even Warren Buffett still drives a fucking town car. You know what right. I mean? It's like it's right. old town car. If that it, 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 I remember seeing this meme um, of a picture of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. I think they, they were at some type of event, and it was like. I think it was like over a hundred billion dollars in this picture and not one Gucci or Louis Vuitton right. belt shown yeah. anywhere. I was like, see that that's not, that's not even just money. That's wealth. It's not, it's not rich. That's yeah. wealthy. And, and that's a big difference between being rich and being wealthy. And it, a lot of times people want to want you to display your wealth yeah. off of the car you drive, the clothes you wear, the jewelry that you rock. And it's like, wait a minute. You, you do realize a person can be wealthy without actually showing any of this materialistic shit off, right? I mean, that we, we oftentimes it equate crazy. that, that so, whole materialistic aspect to it being wealth. A lot of times we find people who do shit like that living beyond their means. Yep. And that's a bigger issue to deal with in the Black community as well, because it's like, we make this much, but we're going to spend even more than what we make per, per, per week, per month, or per year. And it's like, okay, but where did all that money go? Now, you have spent all this damn money. What did you have to show for it? And right. those are the type of things that we have to be more cognizant of when it comes to our spending habits. Yep. And that's something that you said, that, that, that you just lamented to. We don't get taught that early on in, in mm -hmm. life, especially coming from the hoods that we come from. You know what I mean? So it's it's about survival. I need to get this to say, I got it. You ain't got this. So I'm a one up on you when we're, we're basically creating like fake competition among each other when it's like we can be out here actually getting real money and actually creating that wealth for our families too exactly. versus yeah. spending it on wasteless shit that just that ain't gonna be a value later you know yeah. what i mean and, and i always think back not to even go off on a tangent but i always think back on 
income tax season, right? I always think back uh, on, on, yeah. or, or even recently, the stimulus tax. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you this this real quick story that, that I, I found so daunting, funny, and unfortunate at the same time. So I was going to Walmart one day, um, and this was right around the time when income tax, uh, the income taxes came out. And the stimulus checks was coming out to people who, who obviously were in furlough or lost their jobs or whatever. So I'm looking at this couple walking out of Walmart, about a 75 inch TV. They had a van that the damn TV couldn't fit in. So I took a picture of the damn of them putting the TV on the hood of the car, trying to like tie it up. And I'm thinking to myself, I bet you they got they STEMI and they any at the same damn time. Mm-hmm. And it was like, when we get, when you give us an inch, we take a damn square mile when it comes to money. And that is the worst and most detrimental thing that has been to our community when it comes to financial literacy and economic empowerment. We sitting here and spending money, we, we go ball out for 10 days. And then yeah. when, once that damn check gone, we ain't got shit to show for it. But a new iPhone that's cut off, a damn phone, a, a car that we just put, uh, put money on, put money down for that now is about to get repo. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's these are so unfortunate mishaps that we they're self-inflicted. We're sitting yeah. up here doing this shit to ourselves and wondering why we ain't getting ahead in life. It's mainly, but but the start of that is because the lack of knowledge and education knowledge. we have on it. Had we known some of this shit to be of importance to us, I think a lot of times, more times than not, we would make some of those financial decisions that we do make or have made. And trust and believe, I've been guilty of this in the past too, with not fully understanding the power of that dollar, not just now, but later. Mm-hmm. That later matters much more than we would later. like to give it credit to. You know what I mean? Yep. And so from that standpoint, I saw this and I took a picture of the damn couple and I'm like, I bet you they got their stimulus check and the income tax check at the same damn time. Not black folks for me buying up all the damn uh, crab legs from every damn restaurant, <laughs> buying every bottle of peach, a uh, crown, Ciroc, Douce, all that shit. And then once that mo- all that money gone, what do you have to show for? None. You didn't invest in anything. You didn't save much of anything, if you saved at all. Mm. And it's like now, damn, I wish I had that money back. Versus yep. you had the money and you didn't even use it wisely. Forget spending it because our, our first mindset is spend first. Mm-hmm. That we have to break that cycle, man, because a lot of times we're, 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 we're operating in survival mode. I got to get this. I got to get this now. It's that instantaneous mindset that has been screwing with us for far too long. And it's been passed down to generation to generation to a point where our current generation now we're spending so much time having to fix the past on mm-hmm. top of trying to reserve the future too. Yeah. We don't have enough time in the damn day to do yeah. all of this at once. And I want to I want to give a quick spill on inflation and the banks real quick too, just to share this too, because yeah. a lot of people didn't realize this during the pandemic. So uh, first of all, with banks, I'm real big on if you're investing, it's nothing wrong with having a savings account. But you want to look at your savings account as far as spending habits and budgeting. You want to look at your savings account as emergency fund. So this is like your tire breakdown. So you, you got to do something for your kid, emergency. Yeah. You know, you want to have a good, good maybe 6K there, a minimum 3K on a low, low end if you really, you know, don't have the budget for it. Um, and then on a high end, maybe 10K if you really like somebody who who has, you know, the cash flow. But you can use that as your emergency savings. But the thing, the, how the banks work is a lot of people don't realize this. And, and this is what wowed me. Because, um, again, I grew up and they were like, save, 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 Stephen, save, save, save. So it's like you, you're supposed to sit in there and let your money look pretty in the bank account. And this is what's happening. Your savings account, you're getting 0.0% interest, 0.01% interest in that savings account. So that means that pretty much it's not growing. $500 in 10 years might not be a thousand, it might not even be a thousand dollars. You know, you're not, your money isn't growing. And when you're putting your money in the bank, the bank is taking your money and they invest in it because you're not smart enough to invest. So they're like, man, let me tell, let me tell Steven. Hey, we're going to give Steven this credit line because <laughs> yeah. the, the banks make money off interest. So we're going to give Steven this credit card. We're going to give him a $5,000 limit to start off, you know, because we know he's going to max it out and we're going to get some more money off him. Then they were like, oh, yeah, 
go ahead and buy that car. We'll approve you for that 50K car. Because yep. <laughs> we know we're going to get interest on five years for you. Maybe seven if you credit back. <laughs> Man, listen. That, listen, that transitions to my next question in regards to credit. So before I ask this question, I want to quickly say this too. I remember seeing this video of this older white guy talking about the, the importance of credit, right? So he said that his ba bank cards are probably the most detrimental thing to ever give anybody because you're spending your money and you're not getting nothing but what you pay for, for, for that product, right? So he said, honestly, when he uses his credit card, he pay it off. And his credit score goes up each and every time he pays it off. So he's he's using the uh, the, the credit uh, the credit uh, the creditors' money exactly. to pay to buy all these different things versus using his own money. Use your own money. Other then you're money. just buying the product, and then that's that that's that. You're not gaining anything from that except for what you purchase with your own money versus purchasing that same item with someone else's money mm -hmm. and being financially literate and understanding that okay. You have this five thousand dollar limit. They don't mean go to five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That means take a certain amount of money per month that you can actually manage, and and use that money and then pay it off before that 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 billing cycle comes around. That it's going to actually accrue uh, add that interest to that. And mm -hmm. so he said, I do that every single every single day. I don't pay. I don't pay. I don't use my own money to pay for anything. I use their money, mm -hmm. and then I pay it off. And then my credit score keeps jumping up higher and higher. And guess what happens? The more your credit score jumps up, the more the credit. more of that credit limit is going to jump up yeah. now. So now when you're in that 800 bracket, that uh, 800 bracket, now you're part of a club where you get unlimited amount of money given to you because they know that you're spending it financially. You're, you're financially responsible with it. Yeah. And so they're trusting you with their money knowing that you're not going to even accrue any interest on this because you've already paid off this bill before the mm -hmm. billing cycle comes around. Mm -hmm. That That's the financial literacy piece that we're missing so much of. And so, yeah. so getting to this question, how important is it for us to establish good and well, not even good, great credit. How important is great credit? Woo, man. That's it, a lot. It, I know. It's I know. important. <laughs> nah, nah. I, I love this because I've actually lived it and I'm someone like I like I like I like I like your show because I can be transparent on here. You Absolutely, know, to be real. You know, I don't gotta. I've been on podcasts where I gotta muddle. You know, not step no, up no, man. You ain't, listen, you ain't got to church shit up on this yeah. show, man. This exactly. is unfiltered, uncensored, and unapologetically <laughs> black about the shit. Exactly. We're talking real talk to our black <clears throat> men and women out here who need to hear this information. Speak to the mic, Stephen. Go right ahead, man. Yes, sir. So, with credit. So my personal experience with credit is I didn't know anything about, about credit. I'll never forget in college, I went and I was approved for a Macy's card and a Gap card. And my girlfriend at the time, she was like, yeah, we go, go ahead and get it. We go spend it all. We going to pay it off together. So I had to match this card out. I didn't know anything about credit. And this thing was dragging my credit down for like maybe a year, two years until I got in corporate, got a little educated. So I, I don't know what my credit score was, but I know I was pretty much in the low 500s. And once I started educating myself on credit and, um, and I, I started having businesses, I started realizing like, okay, well, I, the biggest thing is one of the, it's your know, credit weighs in, a, in a different, different ways. You got, you got the years, uh, your, your credit history, the years that you actually had credit, you have your utilization rate where pre also have your payment history. You know, your, your payment history is a big thing, big factor also. So the, the thing is, what was killing my credit was my payment history. I went in and, yeah. and because uh, I was able to call the credit card company, let them know uh, I did a financial hardship. So what they did was they were able to waive, uh, they were able to move the late payments off of my credit. Um, mm -hmm. And they also waived a lot of the fees that I, that I actually ended up paying off. Now, if, if anyone's listening to their credit repairs, person you know they'll probably say something totally different like don't pay off that debt anything but 
I had the money to pay it off. So I just did it, you know, just to get out of the way. And I, I, I wanted to build up. So from there, I started just making sure I paid off my debts, any debts that was outstanding, um, you know, like just small bills, things like that. The biggest thing is like, pay your bills, you know, pay your bills. Don't let them go to collections. That's one of the exactly, biggest things. Exactly, man. Doctor that, that, that delinquency, that. That, that, those delinquency yep. Uh, yep. Uh, payments, yep. man, like that, that shit real because you recruited so much interest on that. Now, yep. whatever the original amount you owe was, it didn't yep. already doubled or tripled by now. Yep. And so people are like, oh man, it's going to fall off seven years after. Listen, yep. don't wait no seven years after the, to, to pay that shit off because your credit going to be affected in so many other areas. It's going to prevent you from getting that car you want or getting that house that you want, things like that too. So people need to understand the importance of, of paying those delinquent payments off. And I know for me, I, I was so discouraged with even having credit cards because I saw what credit cards did to my family members and yep. shit. It was like, no, nah, I ain't getting no damn credit card. That shit scared the shit out of me. So like, but I, but I did start to accrue like over time, like maybe the last six years, obviously being married, my wife and I, I we, we actually like every now and then use our credit card, but it, it basically is to help boost our credit score even more. So we're, we're yeah. in the mid 700s right now. And yeah. we're just gaining more and more of that because we understand the importance of having great credit and what that will establish and what that will actually put us in mm -hmm. as far as like being a part of that elite club where if we want to keep using our credit card, then we will. But if we don't have to, then then we can always just have at bare minimum, but keep it active, keep it on, obviously keep it open, but not necessarily be utilizing it as much as we at once did. But yeah, even to that point, mm -hmm. a lot of times I remember having to pay them delinquencies off of stuff that I had in the past. I was like, damn, I thought this shit was already gone, but right. it came back and I'm looking at my credit score and get, getting the printout of it. I'm like, shit, I got to pay, pay this money off. Let me go ahead and do that because- Obviously, at the time that I that I, that I actually accrued those uh, those payments, I wasn't able to like fully pay it off. But then later on in life, when I became much more established financially, I was able to go ahead and pay it off, and then request that they send me a letter saying, "Okay, it's paid in full. It's off my credit score. All that shit. You have to actually pay to you you have, you have to call them to request that kind of information to make yeah, sure that you know and they know. All right, I don't owe you nothing else." Mm -hmm. All right, send me a letter stating this is clear now. So now your credit score can start to go back up again versus being on the, on the decline the way it was. But yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, pay, making the payments, man, is something that's important because we sit up here thinking we've been always told, listen, don't mm -hmm. pay it. Don't even worry about it. It's going to fall off in seven years. Uh, no, it's going to affect your ass from getting any damn thing else. Yep. Anybody going to trust you with money. Uh, anymore if you're not sitting up here even taking the little things that you actually mm -hmm. have accrued and, and was able to to uh pay off and you didn't pay it off yeah. and now it's like you know what no we're not going to even take that risk because now you're a liability more than an asset yep. and the more that the higher your credit score is the, the more you become that financial asset and it, it shows your financial responsibility as it pertains mm -hmm. to managing your money well and that's mm -hmm. something that we have to focus on a lot more too so yeah, yeah again man Having no credit, and then oftentimes you hear that dealerships all the time, good credit or bad credit, or having no credit is like having good credit. It's like, well, you 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 think that until you see that goddamn interest rate. Interest being, rate, yeah. Being 12 and 13 good. damn percent or, or 20% for that matter. And it's like now you're paying more for the car than what the actual value of the car is. Exactly. And for a longer period of time now. Exactly. And so these are the types of things, man, we got to be more cognizant of when it comes to establishing good credit and then being able to pass that good credit down to your kids too. Because uh, part of that video that I saw about the white guy uh, explaining that, he said that he got to a place where he even put his kid, his, his credit was so great, he put his kids on the credit card too and, and made them like secondary holders of the credit card so they can use it and actually start establishing their credit more, coming out like, being 18 years and up, they are yep. establishing good credit at an early age because they were already taught that at an early age versus learning this shit later on in life like most of us have done. Or your mama putting the cable bill in your name. Oh man, you shit. That, 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 that is a black, <laughs> that, that, that is the black community aphrodisiac right there. You need to put the cable bill, the light bill in your kid's name. Yeah. You know, already screwed their damn credit up before they turn 16. Yeah. Now they already got a damn bill to pay. It's like that, that, that yeah, Listen, I remember play. hearing a bunch of comedians make fun of that shit, but that shit is real though. Like yeah. they, that ain't just no joke, man. Like families have actually done that and, and done more harm than good to their kids 
and, and having them to have to flip a bill that they ain't know nothing about before then. <laughs> like, right. That is so damn right. messed up, man. We right. we definitely have to get out of that mindset and putting our kids in debt before they even reach an age of adulthood to be able to take care of themselves. And even yeah. more importantly, when it comes to like savings, right? So you talked a little bit about that when it came to having a savings account. So obviously I have multiple savings account and I have mm. multiple checking account. Mm. And I also even start to like, before my kids even were born, both my daughter and my son mm. already, I've already been putting 50 and hundred dollars away almost every damn week. And I'm right. doing that until they're 21, when they're going to have more than enough money to start off with and even have money to even buy them a car with as well. So uh, yeah. taking that money to start them a bank account when it become of age, but just taking that money for right now and just putting it to the side for them specifically, mm -hmm. that's helping start off their life from a generational well. wealth perspective. Establishing yep. that generational wealth for my kids so they can be able to understand the importance of that and be able to teach it, their own kids that as well. And so it's the mindset of creating generational wealth for a generation that you would not be alive to see. Yeah. You want it passed down. Yeah. A lot of times I remember watching this movie Chris Rock was in. He was, he was, I think it was called Down to Earth. And he actually mentioned something about how when a black guy die, when a white guy die, he leave a will. When a brother die, he leaves a bill. Oftentimes we, we see situations where Black people who, who are struggling financially, they, they start GoFundMe accounts to, to fund funeral services for their loved ones, things like that, versus having the life insurance plans, the actual uh, having savings, having 401ks, investing, and things like that, too. We have to break this cycle of starting GoFundMe accounts. Oh, we have to make man. it normal to not have a damn GoFundMe. Yeah. We need to already have money established. Yes. And again, I'm not sitting up here telling y'all I'm the wealthiest damn person in the world because I'm not. I'm still learning this shit too. But at the yeah. same token, it's understanding that, that I don't know. So I'm out seeking that knowledge and that information because I know how important it is for me and my family to be able to establish and, and create that generational wealth for generations to come. So I want all of us to be of that same mindset when it comes to that. We can't keep thinking instantaneously, I'm, I'm gonna get this money now, get this money now, but you ain't worried about later. I'm not trying to be working until I'm 60, 65 years old. Oh, hell no. I'm in the prime years of my life, making great money, but I know I'm not content with even the money I'm making now. I know it's even more money out there for me to make. So right. guess what? I'm about to go get this shit. So I want all of us to be out here going to go get, having that go get it mindset, man, because it's so much money out here for us to be made. But it we is. have to go out and do our due diligence and understanding the, 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 the just the, the logistics of it and being educated enough so that we can make profits from this. I agree. And just to bounce back to, I know we talked about personal credit too, but once you get that personal credit right, even if you don't even have a 700 right, you know, right yet, just get it close to 700 as possible. And another thing that's very, very good, especially for if you're trying to establish business, business credit is a relationship. So like my bank, I, I have business banking relationship with Chase and I have a personal and business relationship with Bank of America. So Thank with Bank of America, I can pretty much go to them and get anything I want. Um, at this point, and that's just because I had this relationship. So uh, Navy Federal, a lot of companies, they, they will give you a credit line based on a relationship, not even on your credit. It's like, okay, well, this person's been with us for three years. They yeah. have uh, they have their car loan with us. They have their home loan through us, uh, their mortgage. They have, you know, these things. Um, you know, they're, they're, they will give them a chance. You know, so the biggest thing is establish your relationship, getting close to 700 as you can. And then once you get that, once you want to start your business, you need an LLC. Of course, you need a DUNS number. You need an EIN, um, which is pretty much your social security number for your business. Yep. And that DUNS number is pretty much like your Equifax. It's going to be, that's how you're going to build credit uh, for yourself pretty much. Yep, but your business, yep. from there, you're going to get trade lines. So you may have trade lines with uh, Sam's Club or other companies like that. That's going to bill you uh, business banking cards or business relationships. Um, after that, then you go to your bank and just say, hey, I have a business bank account. You open the business checking. And then you, uh, from there, maybe a little bit after, maybe three months, after you have some business transactions, then request a credit card. Now you got leverage. And the crazy part on the business side is they're going to give you sometimes three or six times more le leverage than you have on your personal. So if you already got 10K 
credit cards, you're going to get approved for 30 K on your business. You know? So I just wanted to share that real quick because it's all about leverage. You may not need that amount, but it helps you out. Like um, on Monday, I'm about to close on a real estate property in Decatur. I'm not using my money for that property. I got a 30 K credit line <laughs> that I can use um, to pay for this property. So now I'm taking my money, investing it into assets yep. and getting passive income. That's the way that you want to go. Absolutely, man. And you know what? And to that point about the the financial relationship aspect. So I, I actually have a, a financial relationship with Bank of America and uh, with Delta Credit Union. So I remember back a few, like several years back before I even like got a uh, savings account through uh, Delta Credit Union. I was looking to like refinance my car to, to like pay off my car in a longer time, but in, in, in smaller increments, right? Mm-hmm. So, and then when they, when they told me what my credit score was, it wasn't, it wasn't to a certain standard that, that met their goal in terms of being able to like do business with them from that aspect. And I was like, you know what? Okay, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go ahead and open up my account with you guys so I can establish that relationship with you all and you all can track how much money I'm keeping in. I'm doing more deposits than I am withdrawals. And you're seeing that it's constantly growing. And you also, and I can come back to the table and say, okay, this is my credit score. This is what my, this is what my accounts say. Tell me I, that, I, that I'm not awarded uh, a, a certain amount of money to, to, uh, to do business with you all. Like you can give me a $10,000 credit limit or 30,000 credit limit to your point and be able to take that money and actually make money from that. It's the yep. point of using someone else's money to make money for you. Yeah. That's something that, I mean, all the wealthy people are doing that. You know what I mean? And it's just, that, that's how they stay wealthy. You, yeah. you would never hear any of them say, I have enough money. Ain't no damn such thing <laughs> as enough money. No. Nope. Enough money is more money. That's what the right. hell enough money is. And so right. we have to be in, in, that, in, in that mindset of what we have now is nothing compared to what we can have. Yep. This is something that, well, I mean, oftentimes we talk a little bit I know that I've had conversations with friends of mine about uh, reparations and things that we owe. And obviously, rightfully so, I feel like we we, we definitely owe uh, we owe reparations. But my mm-hmm. thing is, I don't want reparations in the form of a damn check. Because mm-hmm. if you give black folks a check, we're going to do black folks shit with it. We're yeah. we going to spend it on stupid shit and mm-hmm. ain't going to have nothing to show for it. Just like a stimulus check. Just like Plus an income tax check. Yeah, plus you're printing more money. So with the stimulus, everybody got so excited about the stimulus. But when the Federal Reserve- I didn't get no damn money, stimulus, FYI. Right. right. I, I guess I, they say I made too much damn money. <laughs> whatever the hell that means. I don't think I did, but maybe, I, whatever. I mean, right. I so when you're getting a stimmy, everybody, you know, some people need it and no fault. No, absolutely, absolutely. Need. But the people that didn't need it are the people that abused it. Yep. Um, you know, the thing is, it's just kind of like, when the Federal Reserve printed that more money, like the Federal Reserve hasn't printed money in the past decade. This is the first time that the Federal Reserve put more paper dollars into the economy. So for them to print more money, that made the US dollar increase even more. Yep. And now, so what's crazy is the value of the dollar is depreciating. So cash is a depreciating asset. A lot of people say cars, Things like that, cash is depreciating. So that's why we we we're spending on credit. You want to leverage other people's money because you're sitting in that cash. If your cash is in your bank account, it's not growing. And then for one, it's depreciating. Like for me, I personally feel like cryptocurrency is going to be the future because cryptocurrency is not a depreciating asset. It can be um, right now, anyway. But yeah. right now, the U.S. dollar is losing value. You know, so then you got battles against inflation. So a lot of people didn't notice this, but during the pandemic eggs, butter, bacon, normal shit that you buy all the time is more expensive now. It may just be a dollar, maybe a $50, 50 cent. And then they call inflation pretty much the silent killer because where, where it kills the black community is because our income isn't may not be increasing. Just because if you're in a, a household that I grew up in, that, that, that income isn't increasing, but your rent okay. increasing, your cost of living is increasing. The landlord, you know, they like, yo, rent may went from $600 at that time to $700 just because of inflation. Um, gas prices is going up. So your everything, your expenses are rising and your income is not changing. So I think a lot of people is, that's why I tell people, yo, and entrepreneurship is not for everyone, but investing is for everyone because Absolutely. investing is going to help you beat inflation. 
Now, as far as entrepreneurship too, I feel like everyone, everyone says, everyone like, I get battled with this on social media all the time. Everyone doesn't want to be an entrepreneur. Well, <laughs> the pandemic happened there. Thousands of people lost their jobs. Yep, so sure the and millions of people across the world, world lost their jobs. Now, if they have something on the side, it may not help them a lot, but they'll, they'll be able to have another account to live off of. Yep. So it's always good to have something on the side. Find something that you're interested in and build find something that you're passionate about and invest your time into it you know and then kind of go from there don't quit your nine to five because your nine to five is going to fund whatever you want to do yep, that, but, that's your bread and butter yep. but the, the the pandemic woke a lot of people up and it was like damn having one source of income is too damn close to being broke <laughs> you know? is, especially you know? for us because we're disproportionately yeah. affected anyway especially given that that one source of income is not paying nowhere near enough for us to actually make like enough money, like be able to uh, pay our bills and still have enough money saved to the side or just be able to spend whenever we want. It's more of that check by check basis. And it's hey, like, check. okay, if yep. I lose this job, then there ain't gonna be no other forms of income coming in. And so- and my, my accountant professor used to tell us three things. He said, never get your hands sticky, never steal, because you fuck up your life that way. Absolutely. Um, and he always say, um, work, save, invest. And he said, don't be that person living paycheck to paycheck. So I had this 17 years old in my head, like paycheck to paycheck. And then yep. when I went to corporate America, I, I realized what he meant. I'm like, we're going through this cycle. And then I'm waiting one year for a raise. And I'm like, a 1%, 2% raise. So I, everybody, I'm looking at everybody else, they're like, oh, I got my raise. I'm just looking like, bro, like what? <laughs> so it's just like, I, that's where I really started investing aggressively when I saw that. I'm just like, okay, this, this company, you know, and some companies pay good bonuses. Like I had a company that paid 20K, 15K bonuses, and that's yeah. great. But every company doesn't do that, especially every, 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 every company ain't booming power. like that to be yeah, paying yeah, out no big raises. And most of them are paying those big raises to the top execs and to the to those supervisors and things like that. The the, the actual workers themselves ain't they, they getting pennies on the dollar when it comes to a raise. Yeah, it's yeah, like so the, the, the company's profiting so much. Yep. Now we're going to make sure our execs get the, the, that, that treatment right. and, our, and our workers, we'll give them a little bit to, to keep them uh, afloat and saying, okay, we appreciate your, your, uh, your contribution to our success of this company, but not enough to give me enough damn money. Yeah. So that's why you don't want to be in that cycle of waiting on, like I tell people all the time, like you don't want to be in the cycle of waiting on Fridays. <laughs> you know, exactly. you know like, yo, I don't want to set my life up. I'm living for the weekend. Or what, uh, and the thing is, bro, it really starts with your financial habits. Uh, in the black community, we got poor financial habits. We complain about our jobs that we hate. If you hate your job, use the weekend to change your situation. So let me tell, so I break down a little bit of my background. So um, when I came out of college, I actually hated accounting. I didn't want to work in it. So I worked in like sales. I worked in uh, account management. And then eventually I got into healthcare IT, but I didn't get the healthcare IT until I, I realized like during this time when I was working these dead end jobs that I hated in sales, I was going out in the club every weekend. I was a party promoter, but I was splurging money that I didn't have. I was buying clothes every weekend just to keep up with the image. Yep. And to keep take up with pictures the Joneses, for the gram. Man. It's something that, we do, man. something that we do, man. I wanted to do it for the gram, taking pictures for the gram. Yep. And then I was dressing up in suits too. You know, we had that, that we knew. So remember we had that men's fashion era around of like course, 2013. Man. Well, I, I ain't gonna lie to you. I, 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 I ain't getting rid of this, baby. This, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is a yeah, lifestyle yeah. right here. I invested in this shit my yeah. whole life. So, exactly. yeah, yeah, shout out exactly. to the goddamn noobs because we do this shit better than anybody else. You know what I'm saying? But, right. yeah, to your point, though, it's like, yeah, we always dressed up like this. Yeah. We spend a, a bukus of money on, mm -hmm. on just fashion and shit like that when, when we could be saving more of that money or putting it towards mm -hmm. something that's much more useful. So, exactly. yeah, you're right about that. Exactly. So, it's just like, I was splurging on all this money and I was living the image of what I thought people wanted to be of me. So what, and then yeah. my biggest, my biggest wake up was I, I met a girl that I was dating and she told me, she looked at my page and she was just like, only thing it looks like you do is party. And I was like, damn, I do way more shit than that. Exactly. Like, that, that, that shit know, hit different then. It right hit there. different. So yeah. then when I started building these businesses, I had to change my image. I had to change my persona. But I also had to sit down and I gave myself a couple of months to learn different skills that I could possibly monetize. So Absolutely. I learned uh, search and optimization. I learned how to build websites. I learned digital advertising. But what I did was while I was working my nine to five, 
instead of going to the club on the weekend, I used the weekends to build my exit to, 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 to change my situation. So while I was working those sale jobs that I hated, I actually interviewed for a healthcare IT company and I didn't have no experience in IT at all. And when I went wow. in there, I had all of the skills that the people that they currently hire had. So I went in there with, you know, the tech skills that was needed for the job. Yeah. And then also, you know, with the, I had, of course, you got to have a personality too in the interview too. So your personality drives a lot of things too. It drives the conversation. So when I went in there and, you know, pretty much I, I brought these skills to the table, I would, like, I tell people all the time, you got to be so good where they can't deny you, you know? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it was crazy. So it's just like, when you, when you bring those skills to the table, um, you know, I was able to go and get this job, travel, travel over 90% across the world um, and train doctors and nurses on medical software. So every, literally every state I've been to, um, including, uh, I've also been to Alaska and I've been to some of the international projects too. But black men, people in my community where I come from, they don't get that opportunity. Not at all, you know? man. And, and the crazy thing about it is when I left corporate America, I was like, yo, I'm gonna duplicate this life for myself on the business side. So not too long ago, we had spending on business credit. I just got recently approved for the American Express Gold for Barge Consulting Group. Wow. And that's the same card that I had when I was out here traveling for my nine to five. So I'm like, yo, it's possible for you to go out, go out here and create income for yourself and build these businesses and build the things that you want to do. So yeah. anybody listening to this podcast, I, I, I say, don't put yourself in a box. Don't let nobody box you in. You can, if you, if you love your nine to five and what you do, and you're passionate about that, keep the job and, and, and invest. If you, if you don't Absolutely. want, if you don't like what you're doing, change your situation. Like yeah. pit, pit in the work to change your situation. I, I'm big on my group too, <laughs> in my investment community. I tell them like the weekends, like if y'all get frustrated if you're losing in stocks, um, you're not practicing good risk management, things like that. The weekends is where you get ahead. So take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, study the market, find out what's going on. Look in, yeah. or like right now, What's crazy is sometimes it might not make no sense. Like we at war right now, COVID cases and the S&P 500 is at all time highs. So you know what's driving the market right now? Greed, greed. <laughs> greed is driving the market because in a Absolutely. regular market, SPA would have been selling off uh, this past week, uh, tremendously, you know? Yep. So it's, it's different things, aspects about the market that you want to educate yourself, but you don't get started by just, uh, just sitting and waiting on somebody to give it to you. You got to go on YouTube. Like, just like we go sit and we watch Netflix and we make time to do all this other bullshit. We can yep. make time to focus on generational wealth or building yep. different stuff. Uh, you know, I use this thing, uh, this website called udemy.com. You can go on there and find any type of skill that you want to learn on there. Literally from real estate to digital marketing um, and it's low cost. Um, if you're a business owner, you're trying to start a business, you need somebody to a lot of times people say, oh, I need somebody to do a logo, somebody to do this. You can use Fiverr.com. It's low cost. I, yeah, I, listen, I use Fiverr to, to actually do my uh, my podcast <laughs> logo. I had a exactly. freelancer uh, do it for me. And it was only for like maybe 40, 50 bucks. And I was like, man, <laughs> it, it did it so dope. I was like, oh, yeah, this is definitely going to be the podcast logo. But yeah. if to your point, though, man, it's like the very three things is on, on, on the back of your wall right there. Hustle, grind, and execution, man. That, yep. That's something that we need to be living by because too much when it comes to our poor manage, money management skills or just poor spending habits, we go broke trying to look rich. Yep. And that's the damn problem. And I lived that. I lived that life where I was trying to be what everybody thought I was be. I was trying to do this. And then- You're not the only one. Uh, it, it a, a lot of us crazy. have, man. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. It's been one of the most detrimental things in the Black community because it's like, we sit up here trying to buy shit we don't need mm -hmm. to impress people. I mean, uh, uh, with money we don't have to mm -hmm. impress people who don't give a damn. Like mm -hmm. it's yep. mind over matter. Like people who mind don't matter. You sit up here trying to impress <coughs> somebody who don't who you don't even know or don't even care to know, and yep. they, they don't care about what you have or don't have because it's about right. what you possess on the inside more than it's about this this uh, this external shit that you actually want to display. Like yep. that materialistic shit, man. It it, it comes and goes all the time. Yep. It goes. And I think another thing that I do want to expand on too is I'm going to transition into another uh, stream of income that I just started also. But okay. what, so, so another thing is like, so like I said, I was living this life that everybody wanted me to live. And then once I got in my bag, 
when I was traveling the world and I wasn't, bro, I wasn't spending no money. I was, uh, when I'm on the road, I was spending my job money. And I was only on Atlanta in Atlanta on the weekends. So yeah. I may go somewhere, you know, with my girlfriend or, or go out with friends at that time and stuff like that. And I spent a little money on the weekend, but I wasn't really splurging on nothing. I wasn't spending no money. So um, I, I was just saving, saving, saving. And I was driving a 2009 three series BMW. Now I had the money I could have splurged and went up and I had got this new job and I got promoted and things like that. But I didn't, as my, as my income increased, I focused on my spending habits. I was like, yo, I want to spend as much as, at least as possible, as least as possible. Um, I wasn't using Hulu. I answered out, like I, cancel my Hulu uh, subscription, certain things that I wasn't using, I, I, I'll just focus on that. So when I transitioned into, when I, well, in, in 20, yeah, in 2020, when COVID hit, I was actually, I transitioned to a new role uh, back here in Atlanta to focus on business, building my businesses and I was laid off from my nine to five. So during that time, I've always wanted to jump into entrepreneurship, but I had started trading stocks more aggressively. So with, with that income from my stocks, I was able to leave corporate and just focus on building businesses. So during that time, I was able to build Barnes Consulting Group, you know, and, you know, kind of put out my investment courses. And I didn't, it wasn't even a goal to be a business initially. It was just kind of like more so of, of uh, just educating people. I wanted to help people in the stock market. Yeah. And it started off with 10 people and now it's at 3,000 people in our community. And it's crazy. It's like where we talk about the crab mentality, the culture, everybody pulling each other down. My community is so like comforting because it's a place, I feel like it's a safe space where you can go in and no one's hating on you making money. Like Absolutely. people want to see you grow. Every, everybody people need, helping man. you. Yep. And it's mentorship. Need. And you got the mentorship. And it's just me in there really, uh, you know, as far as the admin, <clears throat> and I plan on adding other admins, but we're teaching long-term investment. We're teaching options trading. Uh, we actually got penny stocks. I'm about to add real estate soon. Um, and I'm about to add tech startup investing to the to the, to the the community too. So I built this brand all about just kind of, you know, building generational wealth. But, um, you know, just transitioning to that, during that whole year, uh, my goal was to just stay down and give value. So just having that that one brand did six figures alone in eight months. Now, what's crazy is instead of me, now that's the most money I've probably ever made in my life, honestly. And that and that's not even counting stocks. I, I made over 202K with stocks <laughs> uh, from options trading. So that was a crazy year. 2020 was a crazy year. And, um, you know, on the back end, I lost my brother in 2019. So I ended up moving my mom and my little brother to Atlanta from Greenville, helping my mom out. So a lot of, instead of splurging, I helped my mom out. I helped my brother out. I helped my family out. Yeah. Um, I put them in position. My mom sees me every day, what I do now. Um, and she she's just like, yo, I want to be an entrepreneur too. Because she sees that light. Wow. Um, and that, then I didn't. That's, that's powerful, man. So instead of splurging, I didn't do anything. Like, I'm a big, everyone knows I'm a big fan of Tesla stock. So during the dip, I invested 30K uh, for my severance package from my job in the Tesla. So during that dip, Tesla recovered, of course, and they did a stock split. So this year, I bought my Tesla with stock wow. money, cash. And everybody was like, so I had a couple of friends there just like, yo, so you did. And then earlier this year, I, I really wasn't, you know, like you don't really spoil yourself. So I ended up, I had that 2007, 2009 BMW. So I ended up getting a 2019 uh, five series. And I just got that. And in my head, I had a plan for it. So I'm going to tell you my plan. I'm getting to my point in the future. So <clears throat> now these are regular assets. I mean, these are re regular liabilities that the black community buy all the time. Cars, oh, you know the bank is going to approve it instantly. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I went and bought the car. I bought the BMW cash. The uh, BMW was probably like maybe like 15, 16K. Got a good deal. So that's what stopped money. Took that and I was driving around, had it for a few. And then I was just like, I had a plan. I was just like, I just wanted it perfect time. So my birthday was around June 28th this year. I was just like, yo, I've worked hard. I'm like, yo, I'm going to get my Tesla. So I didn't get my Tesla on my birthday, but I got it on my next day. So I ended up getting the Tesla. And so now I got two cars. Well, actually, I got three because I still got the BMW. Now, I told you guys I grew up in a household that where we really didn't have anything. My mama didn't have a car. And like years later, like I'm 30 with three, you know, so my, my three series, I'm actually giving to my mom. 
With so, test come testimony, know. brother. Yeah. See, th- th- yeah. that, 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 these are the kind of stories that we need to hear more of when it comes to inspiring <laughs> our black men and women in the community, when it comes, especially from a financial standpoint, right? Because we get so discouraged when, we, when we're making little to no money at all, when mm-hmm. we're just down on our luck financially, but understanding how that works when it comes to making making money to a point yeah. where we make our money work for us. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's, it's just a cycle that we have to always be very mindful of and, and to get more people that look like us involved in this because involved. this is what money, real money looks like. Being exactly. able to not have to worry about your next meal, not have to worry about a bill not being paid, not have to worry about your card note not being paid. These right. are the type of things that should not be a norm to us any fucking more. Yep, exactly. This is what it's about, man. So, yeah. and again, I, and I also real yeah. quick, I want to actually, because I don't think I actually congratulated you. I know this was a few years back, but yeah. that real estate technology company that you and your buddies were actually on the news about, that yeah. that was huge, man. Like that, yeah. big big ups to you for that, man. That That's a, yeah. a, a wonderful ass accomplishment that you guys were able to embark on together. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Yeah, tenacity. It was, uh, it was, it's been a journey, you know, so that's the biggest thing too, is that's why I tell a lot of people, like, we want to get invested, we want to educate ourselves, because as a startup founder, tech startup founder, being Black, a lot of times I'm challenged by, they, they want to know, like, if I'm on my shit, pretty much, like, do I know what I'm talking about? Do I know about my product? Do I know about the product market fit, customer discovery, things like that, you know? Um, and it's just like a lot of times if we invested in our community, like we were supposed to, like if like black people drive the culture, you got to think about TikTok, TikTok, yep. black people have drove in TikTok. If, uh, you know, you got, uh, Instagram, even Instagram, um, uh, clubhouse, black people drove the success of clubhouse. So we get black people. We drive all the products when it comes to being exactly consumers, early phase but tech. not investors though. Not investors, exactly. Man, so that, my, and that's why my if goal. Only is, we had, if only yeah, we understood the power the in power. our black dollar that we have, and just the power in our minds that we yep. we should possess. Yep, we, we'll be a lot. Listen, generational <laughs> wealth wouldn't even be an issue for us anymore. It would be huge. So my yeah. goal is with this, with my journey. It's crazy because everything comes full circle. When we first launched to Nasty, it was very successful. It went viral. However, we were trying to. We were trying to reinvent the wheel and, and it wasn't a good fit as far as product. And I realized that during the pandi- pandemic. So we recently pivoted during the pandemic instead of having our apartment locating app, which it once was, which automated the leasing process. And we was partnering with these apartment complexes. We had a contract with Gray Star and it was great. But during the pandemic, things changed. And what I realized is a lot of people got smart about their money and it was spiking investors, especially real estate investors. So I'm like, yeah, we have an area of opportunity. Let's create this property management, tenants management software where these new investors, they may not know how to handle a property or manage a property. Our software does the tenant screening for them, background check, um, manages expenses for the property. They can uh, submit work orders. And then on the front end, we still have our app. But instead of just having apartments on there, we have condos, we have houses, um, we got towns. We expand that, man. And then, that, that, and then, we, that, and then we're doing wonderful. residential and commercial. Uh, and then also the cool thing about it is once they're onboarded onto the app and they select the property that they like, they can pay their monthly rent um, through, through the platform. Um, and also, if they want to use debit card, credit card, uh, connect their banking statements, they can. And if the owner wants to, they can actually accept payment in Bitcoin which is going to be a very interesting aspect um, and where I'm throwing my investment twist in there too, because now landlords can grow wealth from ownership of their property, but they're also growing it through cryptocurrency at the same time. Man, um, that, so that is amazing, man. That's, going to be that you guys, that's groundbreaking, man. And, it, it, and it's only going to go up from here in terms of just the, the amount of people and the amount of, 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 of uh, uh, those property owners investing in that and gaining even more money by by being landlords. That's something, and that's something my wife and I have talked about too. With obviously taking some money that we've profit from, you know, buying, uh, selling our old house and, and actually getting this house, we, we were able to, to profit a, a great deal of money Ooh, from that. Yeah. So we we definitely want to buy other properties to you know act, you know soup it up and, and and just rent them out and become landlords from that from that perspective. So. That way, we're, we're, we're honestly, we're going to be, you know, generating more wealth from that, from that area. So, yeah, man, listen, 
it, so so much to unpack, so much that we have gone over, and so much more that we can talk more about it in, in, in full length detail. But I want to say this: uh, it was an honor and pleasure to have you on the show. I definitely want to have you on the show again, and possibly have some of your business partners. Uh, who are on, on, on Tenacity uh, with you, and even from your consulting group, have you guys on the show to talk more about this in depth and be able to provide more information that people can actually uh, come to you and uh, and just ask for different advice and tips and things like that too. So my last question, how can people actually reach you or reach out to you for those, for those tips and advice? Yeah, so funny thing is, uh, I think we talked about this, but uh, prior to the show, but I'm trying to do a little bit more visual content just to kind of show okay. people I am human <laughs> and, um, you know, the personal fan, uh, personal face of these uh, different brands and things like that. So my Instagram handle is Startup Steve, um, as well as my Twitter. Um, you can also connect with me on Facebook uh, at Stephen Barge if you would like. Um, but um, we're actually going to be raising capital for my tech startup soon um so i'm actually i know a lot of people are not educated on tech startup investing so uh, under Bosch and sota i'm going to be releasing a tech startup investing course which is going to allow people to invest uh and learn how to invest in these early stage companies and hopefully you'll be able to be an early stage investor in tenacity too so um my goal is just kind of everything comes at the end it comes full circle um <laughs> you know um uh, with Bosch consulting group you know my goal is to just kind of you know throw out different avenues of generational wealth. So again, you know, I think I spent on the story a little bit earlier about with the BMW. I recently, I recently, I don't need, you know, extra cars. So I recently just put that BMW on Turo, you know? So I'm gonna come out with a Turo course eventually. And I also partnered recently with a certified public accountant who actually has a course on the full Turo uh, business as far as a tax how to set, set up your taxes and be profitable too. So I'm trying to collaborate with a lot of different people now to kind of, of course, get my vision and my message out. But if anyone want to contact me, they have different questions about, you know, anything I mentioned, vending machine business, Turo, investing, tech startup investing. Um, you know, you can reach me at uh, Startup Steve, just shoot me a DM. Um, I usually respond, you know, pretty instant. If I'm busy, I'll follow up also. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll make sure I provide uh, your your contact information via Twitter and, and Instagram uh, in the uh, description of this show, so that way people can reach out to you, you know, with any with any thoughts or suggestions or even just getting advice from you in, in general, so that way they can you know understand you know what the stock market is like and what what to invest in and buy shares from, and just right. giving just tips overall as it pertains to being an investor because this is something that again we need more of our our black folks in this because that this money making business is going to constantly make money and yeah. we need to, we need to be a part of this, this mm -hmm. conversation. We need to be involved on sitting at this table, making that money too, man, because they don't want us. They made. don't want us. They don't, the GameStop situation that we saw earlier this year uh, with yeah. the hedge funds where the wall, wall, well, pretty much um, the wall street bets are retail investors is what they, what they call us. We outsmarted Wall Street. Yep. They didn't like that they at all. They hated that shit. Hated now, I remember when I saw that, I was like, so that lets you they know were pissed. They do not want us a part of the game. Not at and all. That's why I love my community because it's people in the investment community making 20K, 10K. Like one woman, uh, she was actually pregnant last year. She made 27K in a day off options trade. Wow. And I'm just like, once I see this and, and, you know, a couple of people, it's been 20K days. It's been so many testimonies in there. Last month, one guy was just like, yo, I paid my rent. He lost his job and he paid his rent with options <laughs> from the <laughs> stock market. It paid his rent. So I was just, and he, we had a one-on-one -on -one session. He was like, we actually, you know, went to, we grew up together in the same hometown. He was like, yo, Steve, I want to thank you so much for this community because he was like, bro, I have been having a hard time, but I was able to pay my rent from this. And I'm just like, yo, like, and I tell people all the time, I pay all my living expenses is paid for through the stock market. I don't, I don't use, so, and I want to leave this in, in closing too, because I know we're wrapping up. The goal is to take your earned income from your job and turn it into um, passive income eventually. So your job, you, things that re require your presence is earned income. Things that 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 pretty much are active income, pretty much or income or active income. Things that don't require your presence, like vending machine business, investing in stocks, investing in real estate, um, investing in any type of assets. And which is crazy is your car can be an asset too. So you got Turo, you got Hire Car, 
where you can rent your car out to gig workers who do Uber Eats, Instacart, things like that. So now anything that's like a liability is technically can be turned into an asset. And then if you got credit, good credit, you can go buy all these things that you really want and use your assets to pay for your luxuries. So it's kind of like job, work your job, invest in the things that's going to make you more money and yep. then buy luxuries. You know, that's the, that's kind of like the breakdown. And you can't Absolutely. lose with that. You can't lose with that. Absolutely, man. So, yeah, man, it's been Money Talk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you like, share, subscribe to the YouTube channel of Speak to the Mic podcast show. Uh, I would definitely be providing all of uh, Steve's uh, uh, contact information via Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as well. For you can reach out to him directly for any tips or, or advice or suggestions that you would like to know from him and his perspective on the stock market as it pertains to investing, uh, just ov overall investing in general, and just want to learn just what it what it means to be a black investor in, in, in this in this financial realm because this guy seems to know his stuff man and so i'm honored and, and very uh much appreciative of you being on the show and definitely want to have you on the show again so we can talk a little bit more about it in depth because it's so much to impact that we weren't able to impact all of it but hopefully right. th this was enough information for to get people started with the, just having that conversation with, with their with their friends and loved ones to say you know what let's get this money together because there's so much out there for us to get and with we're with every waking moment we're wasting we're not getting to that money. Right. Let's go get that bag, man. Like everybody's been saying that. They right. Reserve that bag. Get that bag. It's a lot of bags out here to get. So mm -hmm. let's go get that shit, man. So, and appreciate your time, Steve. And we'll definitely be circling back again to have a, a round two of this and, and definitely uh, reach out to your uh, consultant partners. We're definitely going to have them on the show as well. Can oh, I get yeah. their perspective and their backstory as to how they got into this, the, the financial uh, industry as well. And so, Again, man, thank you for the time, and we'll definitely be circling back. So like, share, subscribe to, to, to my Facebook page, Speak to the Mike Podcast Show. Like, like, share, subscribe to my YouTube channel, as well as my Instagram uh, page at Speak to the Mike Podcast Show. You guys can find all the content from previous episodes as well as this current episode. So let me know what you guys think in the comments uh, and share with your friends and loved ones, because this right here, this was a special one, because this is what we're missing so much about. In, in this financial industry, man, economic empowerment and financial literacy is something that was very important to us just as much as our physical and mental health. So mm -hmm. again, appreciate your time, Stephen. No problem. Thank you for having me. All right. If you like what you've heard from this week's episode and would like to hear more from previous episodes, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel below. You can also find me on social media platforms at speak to the mic underscore podcast show on Instagram and speak to the mic podcast show on Facebook. Be sure to also like, share, and subscribe to my Spotify page at speak to the mic podcast show. As I put out more thought provoking content, your opinion and thoughts are needed and appreciated. I thank you all in advance for your support and look forward to hearing from you soon.